So hello everyone and welcome back to the Research Networking Day second session. And I have only a very small role for this session to introduce our next host and moderator of this session. Carla Mayer, who is already here, is an independent researcher based in Berlin, working at the intersections of sound studies, post-colonial and cultural studies, music and culture anthropology. And between 2018 and 2020, she was also a Marie Curie Fellow, research fellow at the University of Copenhagen with her project, Traveling Sounds, a Sensory Ethnography of Sonic Artifacts in Post-Colonial Europe. And she's also the author of the monograph, which I can really recommend to all of you to read, Transcultural Sound Practices, British Asian Dance Music as a Cultural Transformation. So, Carla, the stage is yours, and thank you so much that you jumped in for Christoph Jaka in the last minute, so I really appreciate it that she actually just said yes to be here today, yesterday, so thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm very happy to step in for Christoph Jacke, and I'm sending him my best wishes. Um, so welcome to module two of the Research Networking Day. And we will hear three very exciting uh, presentations on the topic of future scenarios of non-human sound. And uh, some of the questions that we might want to, yeah, that will be asked and that we want to discuss are, what are the aesthetic potential and the political agency of non-human sounds? How might listening to non-human sounds through aesthetic means of sonic reproduction and manipulation also shift the registers of how we imagine multi-species coexistence? And how might creating various scenarios of non-human sound challenge Eurocentric and anthropocentric listening habits and enable more than human and decolonial uh, future ecologies to emerge? So, um, yeah, doing theory through sound and uh, working across dis different disciplines. Justina Stasiowska's presentation will be about fake scapes as a critical post-human approach to soundscapes, acoustic ecologies, and field recording. Questioning practices of colonial gathering of sound, of field recording, and of ethnography, creating fake scapes means manifesting what is overheard, silenced, and under the skin. It touches the affective force of sound in specific mediums and across cultural contexts. Visual artist Aditi Srivastava's talk on mycelic thinking proposes a speculative imaginary as part of her research to initiate a new mode of interaction with plant life. Mycelic thinking attempts to reconceptualize the mode of governance of life on Earth to better account for the role of non-human entities. Basing her research on the investigatory tools employed by mycorrhizal network signaling, Aditi attempts to formulate a form of tactile and sonic interaction based on plant electrophysiology. Sergio Santiago Renteria's research is concerned with how machine listening has shaped the sonic reproduction of birds in both arts and sciences. In his talk on the aesthetics of machine listening, he explores how artifactuality may provide a portal to the vocal cultures of non-human others using the sounds of the Western Australian magpie from, uh, from a digital sound archive. So as you can hear, uh, yeah, we are very much looking forward to, to having you. And I would now um, already like to introduce our first speaker. Um, Justina Stasiowska, and you're very welcome to already come on stage. Justina Stasiowska is a queer Salesian doing so theory through sound. Working in the field of sonic narration, she focuses on notions on, of dramaturgy and design in different disciplines. She writes texts and makes audio papers about the performativity of sound perception, creates installations, and also works with choreographers and directors in fields of dance, design, theater, and film, creating fake scapes in order to think about the effective force of sound in specific mediums. 
The title of her talk is Fake Scapes. Please welcome Justina. Uh, hello. Uh, I'm really happy to be here, especially that my field is about not listening closely or not even noticing. I'm like basically the person that creates in documentaries, theaters, the thing that you just go around, oh, dance, and it's like, hmm, something was there also. So I call like the practice of sound designing, this parasitical practice of uh, parasiting on other people's ideas, but also like on other spaces, the spaces that aren't so elitist and closed and small as musical festival spaces. So different disciplines, different uh, sort of fields and listening practice come into the hand. And I want to start with a little bit of sound, hopefully. This is like one of uh, fake birds I did. Uh, and basically in a theater setting in a play, it was just played. So most of the audience didn't even uh, recognize uh, its fakeness. And uh, the whole practice, I will like sort of like try to present elements of my practice that it's like around more than four years. I don't plan to do a cute book on that. I just find uh, how different encounters uh, of practicing and thinking through practice sp sort of like creates this notion that I feel can resonate within our focus on sound and sound studies because uh, I feel like within sound studies, uh, it sort of like reach the point of stabilization that we actually know what we are talking about. Ten years ago, it was a bit of sociology, anthropology, and different ways of uh, developing uh, what would have been what is listened to. So my fake scape practice, um, comes from thinking that there are like different modes of listening. Listening that you imply in every day, listening that you have like in a concert space. The concert modus of a uh, space has like long history uh, and I think like it also like even shifted with the recording. So I would say like there is like classical listening in concert spaces, but also like different kind of listening within recording field, like when you listen to a stereo and think that it creates space and it uh, creates the essence of like notion of you feel a three dimensional space within stereo option. Uh, so this kind of, also like listening that you don't really listen to attentively. Uh, one of like scholars, uh, uh, musicological scholars that is well known in the field, uh, Alexandra Wee, talks about uh, listening on the border, so not all time attentive listening. Uh, and I was like really uh, interested in how this non-attentive listening actually works and how much it differs. Uh, for example, if you listen to a documentary about some physical uh, place, a rainforest, and you're listening to a bird that you actually know. So there is like this uh, running joke about hearing a bird from Australia in a movie that is like middle Europe. 
and sort of like this sound design practice that you basically migrate one sound into different environment. Uh, and I was like thinking through uh, how to work within this kind of non-listening creating. And my first notion was like connecting to the field recording, something that I think like most of us sometimes do. I don't do it because I don't really like forest. So I'm like the laziest field recording person, so I prefer to do the field record, to fake the field recording. And also like few things that are problematic. Uh, most of the ethnographical research using field recording basically goes in a space, uh, captures sound, doesn't really think how it influences, like the, how the presence of a per person influence and how it connects with the geopolitical situation. So what uh, cis hetero white men from Central Europe would actually listen and hear in a space, environment that uh, was never something of uh, his upbringing. So what are our, I wouldn't say like even possibilities, but what you would actually hear and what would you bring? So the whole process of like using field recording as ethnographic tool basically destroyed the notion of uh, located sound. So you would gather sound and present it as something that's like part of the true, not questioning uh, what you actually recorded, what was your aim, what was the presence, and uh, how much labor uh, and privilege came into you being able to go somewhere. Also, like it came with uh, after talking with a field recordist in Poland that uh, one of the main ones and most famous, uh, Marcin Dimiter, told me that he never records field recording outside Europe because he doesn't really have a cultural heritage connection with that. So the question uh, for me was, uh, what are like the political uh, politics of sampling uh, in a field? And I was like working uh, for this uh, festival in Wrocław and I would get uh, this six months of field recording and not really being able to access the real site. So my practice was to fake uh, the whole parts of field recording to think how we listen to, what are my actual practice of what I listen, do I, use and focus on cheesy sound of the bird, do I focus on like sound of the waves? So this like kind of like structure analysis. Uh, the other practice was uh, that I c came upon was a project that's uh, connected with sonification. So basically you get the signal from a non-human living being and my role was to do a sound uh, recording, not even like a sound recording, but like a sound design. So what would people hear when entering this installation? And the whole thing about that was how do I position as a sound artist my relation, uh, the relation that sort of like implement in an installation? Do I really want uh, a person to walk in listen and walk around, don't really sit, or w what kind of like body movement I am manipulating through the sound. And if like in standard, uh, most popular uh, sound installation that use sonification, you basically have the interaction that you touch a plant and it does music. And it basically sort of like upholds this universal notion of we are all in harmonious music, so the Eastern canonic is all around us, since Pythagoras, not questioning the instruments or technologies. So basically, I, uh, with the, working with the artist, the whole installation was sort of built upon the premise that you are not the owner of the space, not the owner of the plans. 
And the system for the sonification of the plants was that the plants control the fluorescence, uh, so they would choose how much do, uh, light do they need, and uh, basically their interaction with human wouldn't come as this trigger, so it's not really like easy interaction of like, I push the button and something happens, but sort of like uh, the, I was thinking of the audience just as this person that comes in and actually need to change their time, need to like walk and sort of like wait for listen. And it was like basically thinking how much of our way of uh, experiencing time is basically lay upon everything that is non-human. So we basically even expect a rock to be more responsive than uh, not. Uh, and basically adapt to our time. Um, and one of my like attempted uh, installation is basically connected how you represent this kind of long durational processes, how to shift the notion of composition into composing something that doesn't exist in human time, but sort of like uh, forces human to uh, think about different times, also uh, works not in this classical dynamics of accumulation, accumulation, drop, uh, composition aesthetic that we actually really know so well. Uh, and how also like not think about installation that only last 20 minutes people go out, but think about installation that exists without a listener, or like can be approached, get outside. Also, um, the thing that I'm interested in and would also like love in someone uh, would contribute and say their experience, how to make the whole listening more accessible. How, you how to think about listening as a spectrum and not sort of create this notion you have a perfect hearing and you have to hear everything but you have a whole spectrum of ways of hearing, interacting with sound. And um, it's, it's connected with like thinking about what is like the composition, also how to compose with uh, the actual space. Because uh, in the end, uh, fake scapes for me is a way of discussing uh, representation, also like habits of listening. So it's also like against this like white cube notion when you put the speakers and sort of level out uh, the whole uh, surrounding. And uh, my goal is to actually to go in a space and to compose for a specific space, trying to think what I actually really need to do it to make the space resonate which is a much more money efficient because it can be done with really cheap speakers, but with lots of time and acoustic uh, work and analysis. And uh, yeah, I think like it's ongoing and it comes from my different experience in different fields. And this is our like my notes of like going through the practice. So uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Justina. Maybe we can sit down for um, some quick questions. Very short um, discussion, and we will have time after the three presentations for more questions. So um, I'm very, uh, I'm very fond of this idea of the fake scapes, and to really use this this concept um, as a way to kind of, uh, yeah challenge so many kind of registers through which we actually uh, or yeah space is created and and also um, our our perception how how we create spaces through a certain kind of um, also habitual uh, perception um, my question would be if you could elaborate a bit on this concept of doing theory through sound like how and how this um, this idea really, yeah, then gains shape like within your practice. 
uh, because I come from really hu uh, humanities, post-humanities critical studies, um, I was like thinking um, and having like this classical imposter syndrome when I started to do practice uh, about not having like the musical education. So I started to think how to actually not really need musical education, not feel obliged to it and thinking what would actually sound look like and how it works uh, through this um, notion that I'm like equipped with edu uh, an education. I did like performance studies, so most of my notion come from this dramatization, narration, uh, structures. So there are like forms of naming, but I was like wondering how to uh, sort of uh, use them and also like where do they exist on the spectrum of music. Again, Mariam um, share work, she uses notion of scenography, character and everything and dramatization. And um, I was always interested why did she sort of lean into this kind of uh, discourse that basically shape your way of thinking rather than stay in the musical one. So I basically sort of like don't um, lie about being musician, but try to find how much the humanity sitting and reading and just talking can be actually implemented in my work. Great. Uh, maybe another kind of follow up question would be um, when like you talk about um, also the kind of non-human agency of and the kind of non-human time and and so on so so would you conceive of um of your practice also as being kind of decentering the human and i mean there has been this discourse um by uh people like haraway singh and so on uh, who who propose this do you yeah how how do you relate to this idea um, yeah, the thing about like the non-human notions are like there are like two approaches of actually believing you can like uh, transgress the human and be the non. And my approach is more of there are like different ways of naming things and sort of like using the notion of non or xeno to basically create the human. So we are all in a way just. Uh, human in a sense we need something that others to feel really human so the whole practice is for me this kind of like spectrum of discussion uh, where do i politically place the notion of human and what is the relation of power and basically for me like the whole relation of the new non-human is the relationship of uh, placing different power, power elements. So when I was like uh, doing the installation and thinking we need to have different timings, it was mostly of um, not just like giving uh, power to a plant because I don't believe and I'm not so audacious that I can communicate with plants and I know better than them what they need. Uh, so I decided what do I need to do with the human to sort of create new possibilities of listening or like how to shift the habits. Yeah. Great. That <clears throat> I think that's super interesting and also really plays into this question of where the political really comes in when we talk about uh, non-human sounds. Thank you so much for now and I would now like to introduce our second speaker. Aditi Srivastava, please come on stage. <laughs> Aditi Srivastava is an Indian-born, London-based visual artist producing work at the intersection of communication design, moving in image and interaction design. Her multidisciplinary body of work explores speculative futures in the Anthropocene, wherein she aims to tie the unfolding ecological crises in India with histories of colonialism and capitalism. 
Srivastava is also the founder of the harm reduction initiative, No Harm, which operates to reduce the harm that comes with uninformed use and radicalized archaic drug policies in India. She holds a master's degree in art direction from the London College of Communication at the University of uh, the Arts in London. The title of her talk is Mycelic Thinking, an Artistic Inquiry into Mycorrhizal Neural Communications. Please welcome Aditi. Hello. Uh, hey, everyone. I would like to thank CTM Festival Berlin for letting me talk about my research today. It is a privilege to be here and to share this platform with such an incredible lineup of artists. I'll be sharing my two cents on political identity, plant subjectivity, and neural communications. According to Aristotle, human beings at their core are political beings because they possess something known as logos. Logos is a Greek word which traditionally means word, thought, or speech, but it's a bit more than that. It's the ability that, uh, it's the ability to reason that allows a human, and human alone according to Aristotle, to achieve this universal intelligence. As Jacques Rancière puts it, all political activity is aimed at deciding what speech is and what is a mere growl. Rossier fundamentally confines politics as something that only humans are capable of engaging in, and he excludes non-humans from the realms of politics as they cannot possess logos. So if we were to go ahead with that ideology, then how do we account for non-humans who do not speak or communicate using language? How do we account for their political agency, especially when all of our political decisions directly or indirectly affect them? In utilitarian discourses, in fact, all of nature is declared dead, devoid of any agency. And this is beautifully illustrated by James Scott in his book, Seeing Like a State. He talks about how vocabulary and language used to categorize nature show this overriding interest of human users. So words like nature are replaced with natural resources, with an emphasis on the elements of nature that can be appropriated for human use. Plants that are valued become crops, and species that compete with them are stigmatized as weeds. Concerned with the same questions of how to think of politics with non-humans, Iona Janica puts Rancière's idea of speech versus growl through the lens of Bruno Latour's concept of politics. Latour's idea of logos is not much concerned with who can speak. He instead looks at logos as conveying meaning or significance. And that opens up the prospect of including non-humans, because the communication of meaning can happen even when language is not involved. Latour's concept of logos is grounded in Grimassian semiotics. Uh, Grimas, considered to be the most prominent of French semioticians, forms the framework for sense-making on the premise that the production of meaning is mostly a process of translation. If I was standing here and speaking in my mother tongue, I doubt I'd be comprehensible to any one of you. So, unless you spoke Hindi. But rather than, um, this means that speech inherently doesn't have meaning. But rather when it's dynamically translated, does it acquire significance? In Latour's thought, speech is mediated through a variety of entities mediums, procedures, techniques, and devices. Janika, in her analysis of Latour's framework, puts it, the ultimate challenge in this framework is, we might say, technical, in the sense that it is a question of finding the right tools and techniques to capture the strands of signification and transcode them. If I was to think about what I'm doing right now, speaking to you, and look at it from the lens of conveying meaning through transcoding and translation, I can say that my thoughts are causing this neural activity in my brain, um, which translates to speech, and then my words, which I speak out loud, are being transported through the medium of air before they hit your ears. Um, which set off these tactile vibrations in your eardrums, and then this external stimulus is transcoded into neural activity in your brain, allowing you to think, perceive, and make sense of my meaning. 
Guided by the principles of plant electrophysiology, I understood that the fibers in the vascular tissues of plants carry out the same function as human beings' nervous system. In fact, a plant's nervous system physically extends beyond them and connects with other surrounding trees through something known as the mycorrhizal network. I looked to the works of Suzanne Simard, a pioneer in the burgeoning subject of plant neurology, to understand how trees communicate through this neural network. The mycorrhizal network is this multi-tangled uh, web-like structure of fungi roots that interconnect forest ecologies under the soil. This network is made up of these uh, tiny, fibrous, thread-like structures called the mycelium. Mycelia gently, gently penetrate the root shafts of these trees and gracefully wrap around the inner nervous tissues. So tangibly intertwined, they're able to pick up any electrical pulse. They act like efficient stockbrokers uh, and carry out delicate negotiations with bigger mother trees, bartering soil minerals like nitrogen and water in exchange for photosynthesized nutrients like carbon and sugar. The smaller trees or plants, uh, which are unable to get as much sunlight due to the vast shade coverage of the bigger mother trees, would die without mycelium bringing them their bartered exchanges. The trees also share information using this neural network. When a mother tree is dying, it sends off mass impulses to all the neighboring plants as if passing on years' worth of knowledge. Like intimate, sophisticated conversations that take place behind closed doors, forests are pulsating with the vibrant buzz of unseen chatter with the help of their underground dwellers. There are deals and delivery of resources being arranged, signs of warning and threat being passed along, active choices and decisions are being made, and who knows what else. These are all characteristics of a highly intelligent and civilized society. Suddenly, from being inanimate props in the background of our narrative of the world, plants become active participants, creating a whole world or worlds of their own. Imagine the kind of talk that must go around about us within their world. Here's where I would like to put forward my argument. Following a chain of translation and transcoding where significance or meaning is transformed at every stage, sense-making then primarily happens at this stage, the stage where neural activities um, in beings who are communicating with one another start to resemble. The obstacle then keeping us from vitally engaging with plants is a technical one, this technical transcoding bit. How do we pick up their electrical activity? How do we decode it? How do we transcode our own and send it across to them? Andrew Adamatsky is a computer scientist best known for his research in unconventional computing. Um, and he tried to see if these electrical signals found in fungi-to-fungi -fungi signaling had some trail of repetitive patterns that formed a syntax, and if they did, could, this, uh, could a language be constructed using this syntax? He said that if we were able to decode spiking patterns of fungi, we would be able to speak back to the mycelial network. So I kind of conclude without concluding, like, what if instead of optimizing social media ads or plummeting money into online surveillance for marketing, we redirected our priorities towards our technological resources? Call me optimistic, op Optis, uh, optimistically naive, but if this were to happen, what if we could get access to years' worth of knowledge of mother trees, a cheat code to a symbiotic life? What if we could learn a new mode of resource sharing from the multicellular intelligence of the smart brokers, the mycelium? What if we could get forest ecologies a seat at the political table? Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Aditi. Let's uh, take a moment and uh, one or two questions maybe about this highly interesting uh, oh, thank presentation. You. Thank you so much. Um, I was thinking um, in terms of listening and how what you've been talking about might also expand the ways in which we perceive of listening as listening like solely with the ear to yeah, a more kind of multi-sensorial way of listening and uh, yeah, some kind of kind of 
a way in which listening resembles touch as mm -hmm. well. Can you relate to this uh, idea? Uh, yes, actually I would uh, bring forward two people whose research uh, kind of guided me here and one of them was um, Salome Vauglin in her book Sonic Possible World. She actually talks about how most of our reality is produced by only one of our senses, which is our vision. And uh, the other senses aren't favored as much in the process. So with the act of active listening, we can actually uncover a whole new possible world. That's how I understand her work. And uh, then I kind of tie it to this, or the works of Monica Galliano, who like experiment, she's this plant biologist, and she experimentally proved for the first time that plants can hear and they produce their own sounds. It's like this clicking sound, which like warns if a, if a tree has like, uh, is infected by an animal, it will produce this sound so that the animal, so like the insect would like move away from the tree. So, I mean, there are these, um, modes of active listening already happening. I feel like we just need to attune ourselves a little bit better or maybe form, an, again, a technical mode with which we can bridge the gap. Yeah. So, and where would you kind of, where do the politics come in? Like, where do you see, like, the political potential? You already uh, drew upon this a bit, but maybe you can elaborate right. a bit more. Uh, I feel like that's the challenging bit, and this is obviously an exploration, but... Um, in my idea, I don't think politics should just be refined to who can speak, but rather how do we make sure to get everybody a seat on the political table? How do we provide um, means so that things that are people who are unrepresented or entities that aren't represented as much get a seat at the political table by focusing on uh, providing them a, like a mode of translation so that, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. I, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah okay. totally. I think, um, yeah, it, it really seems to be, yeah, also um, getting at new kind of knowledge making practices also by being more attentive to these, uh, these various, for instance, um, mycelic uh, networks uh -huh. and, and so on. Yeah, thank you so much. We will. Um, continue the discussion after our uh, last speaker today. So thank you again, uh, Aditi. So our last speaker for today is uh, Santiago uh, Renteria. So you are welcome on stage now. Santiago Renteria's research is concerned with how machine listening has shaped the sonic reproduction of birds in arts and sciences. He is a recipient of the PhD studentship awarded under the Australian Research Council Discovery Project, A Cultural and Intellectual History of Automated Labor. During his master's, he developed a Shazam for bird song based on a machine learning technique capable of recognizing birds' complex melodic sequences. He has showcased his work at multiple venues, including Symbiotica in Australia and Laboratorio del Arte Alameda, Centro Cultural Universitario um, Tlateloco, Carnival de Baja Dora, uh, and Tecnologica de Monterrey in Mexico. Um, his uh, talk is entitled The Aesthetics of Machine Listening, Reanimating Sonic Ecologies. Um, welcome and yeah, the word is yours. Uh, hello everyone, I'm very happy to be presenting here uh, uh, such a prestigious uh, event uh, cross disciplinary between music, uh, art and technology. I'm not going to play sounds uh, in this presentation because I want to talk more about the concepts, but I'm more than happy to share with you if you approach me uh, at the end of the presentation some of the experiments that I, I've been doing uh, with the magpie sounds. So some of the questions that I am uh, interested in um, relate how uh, we appreciate humans and non-humans through technologies 
uh, mainly recording technologies. Um, what I uh, describe or understand as machine listening uh, is, is a, uh, an umbrella term that I use uh, for different technologies, not only uh, artificial intelligence technologies. So I ask what is the kind of portal that uh, machine learning can provide uh, to large databases, especially and environments? Uh, how do we engage with this uh, more than human in terms of scale, uh, temporality, and also uh, of existence, uh, different types of, of beings that are non-human? I'm also interested in the process of standardizing uh, listening that is uh, uh, involved in the, the process of technification uh, uh, from recording technologies to uh, modern artificial intelligence techniques. And finally, also the, the aesthetic possibilities of, of what can be done with these tools beyond uh, controlling and beyond classifying uh, sounds. So I have an hypothesis that is uh, mainly derived from uh, media archaeology. Um, so this uh, hypothesis is that there is uh, an autonomous technologos uh, within machine listening, concrete implementation. By technologos, I understand the algorithm performing, not only the logos, which would be the logical uh, arrangement. So what, um, what is revealed in the experimental use of, of these technologies, and I call this um, archival art or unarchival art, uh, which is about recomposing the audio files and the archive, which sometimes these archives are, are used for different purposes than the, the ones that uh, the artists or me or, or myself are using uh, them. So that's the part of the unarchive, that we are disrupting the, um, the order of the archive as used by the discipline that created it. So why is uh, mathematics not enough? Um, well, because mathematics and engineering uh, don't touch directly upon the uh, histories and the essence of, of technology beyond the abstract and the symbolical. So uh, here uh, Wolfgang Ernst uh, uh, addresses this question that this essence uh, uh, cannot be logocentrically reduced to uh, just pure mathematics. Uh, so we have to experiment with the machine beyond uh, the theoretical mode of computation. Uh, this is his, this, um, Modes of listening are uh, framed, or well, I, I frame them in this uh, genealogy that is, of course, not, not final, but it's, it's a way of uh, exposing the uh, discontinuity between the cultural techniques that uh, were used to reproduce sound from uh, vocal mimicry, uh, mainly whistling, the uh, development of alphabets that uh, discretized and made uh, sounds uh, reproducible and transferable, and also the techniques that were used to uh, listen in general, like auscultation techniques uh, that are well known in medicine. After this, then the human uh, became less and less involved in the process uh, with the phonograph and the other technologies that automated the process of recording and writing uh, sound waves until we reach um, full automation of the recognition of a speech and the computational uh, scenes that uh, can be analyzed with, uh, without the direct input of a human. Finally, we, uh, we reach this concept of planetary auscultation, which is a uh, deployment of sensors um, around the globe and the uh, automation of, of listening uh, in this case. Um, so here I, I am very critical of the idea of listening because I don't think it really helps uh, making the uh, listening uh, analogous to the biological listening, because there's a material uh, difference and there's also an algorithmic uh, mode of operation. So we could say that, in a way, this listening uh, is sub-phenomenal. There's no experience in the listening of the machine. And, and also, it's um, non-cochlear, and no ears are involved uh, in this listening. So what this kind of listening brings me to is uh, uh, the patterns that we can uh, uncover from archives and collections. Uh, uh, this works as a kind of sonic uh, reanimation. So, uh, in this quote, uh, Louis Kaplan is uh, emphasizing uh, the resurrection uh, that is involved in the playback and feedback uh, of technologies. This dance between noise and signals, and they operate in the in the media that also haunt us from from the past, and then can can raise uh, back that sounds that are long forgotten might be revealed by uh, these technologies in very deep archives through 
the use of uh, machine listening. So one of the technical questions here uh, is what do we do with all this data that is increasing uh, given the a mass uh, technification of listening and deployment of sensors. So one of the uh, ways of addressing this is uh, mainly through classification algorithms like probably, you know, Shazam or other uh, applications that are used to uh, recognize and classify sounds. Spotify and other uh, platforms have uh, algorithms that will, um, will uh, create taxonomies of, of the sounds. So what I propose here is that, well, what if we, we open the archive with a non-logocentric uh, approach uh, that is uh, not based on classifying the sounds? In this case, um, the sounds that are coming from the Magpie archive, um, this is an archive that was um, recorded between 2014 and 2021 uh, by a group of researchers at the University of Western Australia. So it is a scientific archive, uh, mainly uh, was recorded to study the um, communication of magpies and corporate behavior. Um, I collaborate with them, uh, but I'm not doing uh, properly science because I'm more interested in the aesthetic possibilities of using the archive. Uh, it's about 70 gigabytes of, uh, in terms of size. Uh, it's not publicly available because it's uh, protected under uh, the um, university data management uh, protocols, but um, I am exposing some of these uh, sounds and uh, experiments through, through my artistic practice. So one of the tools that I've been using uh, is uh, Flucoma. Uh, it's a tool that was developed at the University of Huddersfield uh, in the UK. There are uh, other techniques that, you, that can be used to address this question of the non-logocentric uh, manipulation of the archive. Like probably you have heard about the fusion models, uh, very popular right now with the DALI same uh, technology based on probabilistic modeling, uh, autoencoders, uh, timbral morphing techniques that are, are based on um, more like linear algebra, um, techniques that uh, deal with uh, signal processing. Uh, but here I'm, I'm just going to go through um, one of the practices that uh, is quite, I think, simple to understand in terms of technique because it uh, it can be traced back to the cut-up techniques of uh, Baroque and the I Ching and the, also the French uh, Olipo and uh, Plunder Phonics, which has this technique of sampling different sounds and concatenating them according to particular rules. So these rules um, have been uh, explored in different ways from the selection of the materials uh, manually, like listening, like uh, uh, in a... In a kind of direct way to the materials, but also have been automated uh, to the extent that the databases are not listened, listened at all. So it's this way of earless listening that is present uh, uh, at the top of the axis uh, there, which is uh, fully automatic. And also the analysis of these sounds uh, has been exploring ways that it doesn't rely on the uh, music um, analysis or the sound analysis uh, through human means. So I put the practice up there to uh, emphasize that it's fully automated. And it's uh, mainly these three um, uh, aspects. Uh, first, we segment a database into different chunks using uh, metrics. Then we analyze it using uh, feature descriptors or uh, transformations. And finally, we concatenate these sounds uh, automatically based on, on some uh, template. This template can be uh, a musical score, something uh, that you can de design uh, piece by piece, or you can recompose, uh, for instance, the sound of a, the human voice with the chunks of magpies. So that's what I've been doing, um, recomposing uh, human sounds with different um, uh, chunks of magpies, but using machine listening as the tool to engage with the archive in a way that it doesn't rely on me classifying the sounds uh, manually. So. Um, the alternative pathways that this um, suggests in terms of automation is that the, we are uh, disrupting this standardization of the archive. I'm not using the taxonomy that the biologists used. Uh, and also, I am uh, providing a different way of, of reading the synthesis of, of the uh, MAGPI archive in, in a way that it doesn't involve directly uh, the logocentric uh, taxonomy. So I want to close with the... Um, with this quote, um, 
which is uh, about how we uh, relate to digital technology. So Ryoji Aikida music demonstrates that digital technology does not have a human sensory and cognitive system. This is what I mentioned, that we shouldn't uh, anthropomorphize a machine. It's not listening in the same that uh, biological systems listen. But we shouldn't understand this as a, as a limitation. So instead, this allows us to experience the difference between a, a human kind and a digital kind of listening uh, that is fundamental to this doubling act of perception, how we, we see a complement in, in what the machine can afford that there, there's, is not present uh, in the human. Um, so that's uh, for now. I'm happy to discuss more about uh, in the question session and after the presentation. Thank you. for a few quick questions now before uh, we kind of gather as the whole panel. <laughs> um, so the, the question that interests me um, is, yeah, how you perceive this whole field between like doing research on sound and listening listening and especially machine listening uh, within this, these realms of arts and, and sciences. I mean, there's a lot going on already in this direction, but how do you perceive this um, kind of cross-disciplinary um, work and what are the potentials, but also maybe the, the limitations? How do you feel kind of navigating uh, this? Yeah, I, I feel that I'm uh, part of being excited because I'm be working as an engineer and obviously uh, think that we are technical animals and then we cannot reject technology. Um, but also there's uh, quite a lo lot of hype in the language that we, we use, uh, especially these cognitive, uh, sometimes very pretentious terms like they use attention or kind of memory, which there's an inspiration, but there's also a way of overselling them. So I think it's important that um, humanities students engage directly with the engineering but also that the engineering people broaden their perspective of, look, it's not just about using the tool in the, the way that it's more optimal sometimes. We want the tool sometimes to fail or to reveal the way of operation. And I particularly find, uh, well, the approach of the media archaeology uh, fitting these two requirements because it's between humanities and, and engineering. And then you can see uh, the different threads uh, blending in in, uh, in very interesting ways. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And uh, what about the like the larger public discourse? I mean, I was very interested um, in this kind of Shazam for birdsong and how is this also created as a way like really for everybody um, potentially put this, this app on, on his or her phone kind of and, and detect the different bird songs. Like what kind, what's the kind of impact that um, you and, and this whole project actually um, um, kind of expect this to have on on the on a more general public mm -hmm. yeah, uh, level. One of one of the aspects that I when I've been thinking in this non local centric way of approaching the archive is that you are not relying anymore on the specialized language of the taxonomies that biologists use. So you are opening this to um, the public that can use. Uh, for instance, I think I didn't mention it, but I'm thinking about using this to translate the human uh, whistle kind of reenacting re re this oral whistle culture in, through the machine so you can whistle and then translate your sounds into uh, animal sounds and then kind of prompt this database with your voice and then you can see reflected uh, yourself there and then you don't need to be specialized in the database but you are connecting with the animal and the way that the animal produces uh, sound. Very exciting. <laughs> um, yeah, maybe we can now open uh, the floor. We can ask the other two speakers uh, to come on stage and uh, join us on the in this panel. So right there. this 
Okay, so here we are. Uh, Justina, Aditi, and Santiago, thank you so much again for uh, your three very exciting talks. And there have been some um, interesting also interrelations in spite of um, yeah, these, these very different angles. Um, and so, yeah, one, one of the questions that I found uh, was resonating was like, to th like how to think beyond this logocentric conception of sound. Uh, and also the other um, questions about the different modes of listening, that listening um, is conceived of as situated and multisensorial, but that there's also listening beyond human audition in a way, so earless <laughs> listening, how, uh, how you formulated it. Um, so uh, maybe you can just directly, if you wish, um, say something about if you kind of heard some of these resonances within the others' talks and uh, what do you think, like how, how can we push these boundaries of, of uh, conceptions of sound and listening even further? Um, <coughs> I was like thinking throughout the whole talks about um, how cybernetics became a solution. And the problem for me was always that um, cybernetics always was a science of managing and trying to build everything into manageable. So I was uh, thinking how it works for me in this notion of I'm planning an installation and have an audience. And they sometimes don't react the way I planned them to. Like one time uh, after my concert, one person said that she had to get out because her eyeballs were scratching from behind. And she finds it really pleasant, but she couldn't handle it. So I felt that there is like the scope of using the cybernetics, using it as a theory of communication and mathematics uh, into this um, to a moment when you also like have this affective resonance um, and trying to really be in this uh, modus uh, of um, there is much more than um, just taxonomies. They are useful in the, in the sense that um, I would refer to a theory that it's much earlier than Bruno Latour, Michel Serres. He defines technology as stabilized relation. You also like see it in the Bruno Latour's work. So basically every technology is like stabilized relationships. So throughout the relationality, you also don't need to speak about specific sound. So basically speak about like the whole scope of senses. Because if we will sort of stick with what is sound, it's also elitist and it also doesn't take account uh, people who have like a different spectrum of hearing. And I think like rather than position ourselves in this like gathering of knowledge of specific sound, and I felt that within sound studies there there is, are like bits of critique and it's like basically now crumbling into not being fulfilling. Um, there should be like this modes of perception and and I think like even in classical works, Jonathan Stern, uh, he distinguished modes of uh, listening, but also says that uh, there is like this problem of oculocentries. And the thing is like even within technologies of like sound, especially sound reproduction, uh, visual was a dominant one. Even in acousculation, uh, phone recording, it was the vision of a line. So we basically aren't specifically sound that wouldn't be visual, sound that wouldn't be haptical. So I think like rather than telling ourselves this fairy tale of listening as something that isn't bodily, we we need to like back down on being so sound. <laughs> Do you want to relate? Oh, to yeah, I was, was yeah. going to uh, reply to that because I um, remember that uh, Jonathan Stern 
uh, one article questions this idea of is the machine bringing new modes of listening or is it just kind of reenacting them or re kind of recreating what was already there. So some, sometimes when we, we see these uh, technologies in a solutionist way that uh, we want to deploy this in the Amazon and we're going to probably extract more patterns, but also the local people have the listening knowledge uh, that is, is not standardized. So I think that can be missed when, when we rely on a, on a technolo technology that is so powerful but ignore other, other modes of listening to the environment. Yeah. Maybe, uh, would you like to respond uh, directly? So when I was um, really obsessed with this idea of uh, utopia and dystopia, I came across that you're right, techno like a technological technocratic solution isn't going to save the world, but we have to do it like the hard way through politics. So it's politics at the end of the day is about how we relate to one another and how we decide who gets what. So that's where it boils down to. Maybe we can also go uh, back to one of the questions that um, I asked at the beginning. Um, how might listening to non-human sounds through aesthetic means and using different techniques and technologies um, of sonic reproduction and manipulation might also shift the registers of how we imagine multi-species coexistence and also like, yeah, how, how yeah, where where are we now in this? You know, also, um, um, and 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 we yeah we learned about different techniques and technologies that you kind of proposed. Oh, well, I'd like to answer. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, very interested in uh, communication of animals because there's I think you already mentioned that there's communication without language. Uh, but there's also this whole uh, field of zoomusicology that is kind of the understanding of the animal communication as a musical system. So also I think expands the notion of music uh, beyond just durations and pitch, uh, which is quite close to the sonic arts, and also is expanding the, the, the human world beyond the logos, because you know, in the Greek uh, study of music, it was based on this perfect system. And, what other systems of communication can afford. I think through the arts, one can, in, can engage with this effectively instead of uh, through one mode that is more like a strict, more uh, technologized. Uh, so it's kind of turning upside down the idea of technology as control um, and using it more like as a playful uh, a way of generating wonder and going beyond the logos. Um, I would like also to invite the audience to ask any questions. So please feel free. Anyone has a comment or a question? There's someone there. Hi. Um, how far are we um, to communicate with animals, or probably with plants? I mean, in years, how, how far we are? And also, it's, there is a like big corporation, just like investment in, in money, to make that technology happen. I mean, obviously, I think it's already happened. I think that there's a lot of research, but uh, just just like a common question: how far we are? Because I think that's gonna be possible kind of soon, and a lot of the humans are really to have a communication, especially I think probably with the dogs, <laughs> to have kind of communications with them. Yeah. Just wondering how far we are. Uh, so in, in, to, in April 2022, just last year, I spoke about this uh, computer scientist called Andrew Adamski, where he tried to pick up um, these electrical signals between mushroom to mushroom signaling to see if they were forming some repetitive patterns and if this pattern um, showed some sort of syntax and whatnot. But I feel like the problem there was that he tried to anthropomorphize them. And I feel like that is the holdup in communication, like if you automatically look at communicating with plants and animals through a human-centric approach, we might, we might take longer to get there. So I think the, the key aspect should be how do we, should be just observation and understanding first of what exactly is happening there and then try to look at it if, how do, uh, um, I'm losing my, I hope, yeah, that. Sorry. Uh, 
I just want to add, yeah, I, I sort of like, uh, I'm so far that because the project I was like taking part, it was based on the work of Professor Hazem Kaji, uh, who basically didn't focus on the communication of plants, but sort of like enabling plants uh, signaling through photosynthesis to shape their environment. It was like sort of like allopoietic feedback loop when the plant throughout its needs of uh, light would distinguish the amount of it. So basically, the thing is like, it, in the simplest words, we don't need to hear from a plant uh, that it needs water, it will just take its own water or like adjust the sound. So I think like, what is our political goal rather than like, feeling that we need to be an element to it or we can sort of like uh, create a system for the non-human to fulfill their, their needs as we have done for ourselves. Yeah, I was gonna mention something about translation because I think it's a special type of portal and I was, uh, Reminding Paul Ricard uh, work on translation and there, there's labor on translation and there's always a creation of a new text. So when we think about translating animals, probably we're creating a new text for, for us to read the animal. So we cannot really access uh, directly their humble because we don't have the experience of being that animal. So it's so, so something so remote to us that I think instead of, of thinking this as a, as a point where we're going to fully understand the animal, we, should probably be more humble. And it's like we are creating these texts for us. And there are so many different ways of uh, relating to animals that might come out of this technology. I would Thank like you. to add yeah. one more thing to it. I just remembered. Tim and Gold, an anthropologist, spent years understanding this tribe of reindeers. And he tried, he socially understood them by completely removing uh, the comparisons to human societies. And even while doing so, he was able to find something within uh, their societal makeup which resembled ours. So I think it just really depends on how do you remove yourself and your own values from the equation when you look at another species, and that will in turn help in bridging that gap or finding a means of interaction with them. Any other questions from the audience? Oh, there's one online question, great. I will uh, read this out and thank you for the engagement of people um, joining online. Uh, Shrey Katuriel have a question for everyone. How do you all perceive non-human sound in the discourse of music? I think I already mentioned uh, the musicology. Um, this, well, I think it's a tradition that goes back probably to uh, Oliver Messiaen, um, probably before the Western world, the appreciation of the animals, and also remember David Arams ha has a beautiful book called the uh, the, uh, the census uh, notion of ecology, uh, where these words of the Koyukon Alaskan uh, people are infused with the voice of the animals. So when they use language to communicate with other people then they sound like the call of the animals. So in a way, the language is informed by the sounds of the environment. So I, that's how I perceive it, that there's, like, there's no separation at all. And then the, the meaning that we make uh, of the environment determines also the type of sounds and language. OK, yeah. Maybe we can also, um, uh, so Shrey also um, continued this, uh, asking this question, um, saying there is lots of music labeled as ambient music, but do you think that uh, it's a zenith of where nature and human will coincide in making music? Also, what do you think is the immediate future of plant-based sonics in the realm of AI music? I must say that I actually love that the ambient music became the new Muzak. That we basically uh, are sort of like, I would say the non-human is like the whale sound that you use to go to sleep or like 10 hours of uh, forest sound. Yeah. 
And it's like fascinating because it doesn't really have even an artist. It doesn't really have an artistic genius to, to it. it. You don't really feel that it's like aesthetic. So there is like for me this like amazing thing of like having this fake future of ambient sound that actually isn't so exciting. Uh, and it's all around our habits. And for me, like the interesting part of the whole question and the research is like, um, why do we need it so close to us? How, how are architectural, physical structure made us need the ambient sound? Sort of like to attain the ambient sound without going outside, uh, uh, without uh, having, and why does in all the ambient sound you don't have basically the thing that I always listen in into forest? So like the works of cutting down the trees or like the the things that for me is the reality of functioning of a forest, of being part of like this political element of techno nature element. So I think like we exist in, in this like the future, but sort of like this uh yeah, it sort of like presents itself as archaic, uh, utopian future, um, but it's like really so inscribed in the habit and our notion of nature um, that we don't really think that it is what it is. Is there um, maybe a last question from the audience? Otherwise, I would also... Oh, there is one. Yeah, please. We have time for another question. Over there. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm interested in the concept of uh, limitations of technology and tools and I would like to know more and share some interesting stories about uh, situations where the limitations of the current tools and technology used were deemed uh, insufficient and whether they improved the methods and the science behind your processes. Oh, well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I think uh, when I started this, like, experimenting with these a AI models, um, I realized yeah, they are super data intensive. And if you, you don't have a, a computer or you don't rely on a server, and also the data sets, and there's also a lot of tinkering that you have to do. So all, all these models that are presented like in the public, like they work smoothly, they actually have a lot of labor. Um, so I think the, the limitation is it's always there, but it's kind of under this very neat interface, and and yeah, it's going to be part of, of the process itself. Yeah. I think, uh, like for me, uh, the whole um, choosing to fake the sounds, it's like also like data efficient because uh, the weight of like recorded sounds are like way bigger. That's why you, in the games, you usually rely more of, on synthesis than uh, the sort of recording of the sounds and you have the repetitiveness. So the, the whole like notion of uh, limitation is also like um, the geopolitical one. How much uh, space do you have? How much uh, computer efficient? How much does it take to stream? So it's also like the, the for me the limitation just shows who actually can use the technology or like listen to the technology and like who who have the access and privilege okay i think we are now uh yeah at the end of this uh, module two thank you so much again justina aditi and santiago for being here and for contributing and um, when we have now another small break of, of 20 minutes, and then we will, uh, we will meet back here for module three. Thank you so much, all of you.